I'm starting today with this quote that I found. We are social individuals driven by the need for relationship. I think that is core, to my work as a therapist, I think it's core to when we're, whenever we're thinking about label identities or whatever it is, trans, whatever, we want to be connected to other human beings. And there's a, there, is a, there is a set of criteria for acceptability. We have our own levels of social currency. And we're ultimately looking at, can I make my social currency leverage enough to belong to people? We know then that within the um, sexual and gender minority uh, groups, as, as was uh, illustrated earlier on in that excellent talk, the, the coincidence of depression and anxiety and things like relationship to difficulties with self-esteem, self-harm, well, they're kind of natural sequelae. If people hate you because you're a fucking poof, you're kind of not going to feel good about yourself. If people don't want to play with you, if people don't want to play with you because you're sissy, they won't pick you for teams. We don't want him in our team. It kind of injures your sense of self. So that it isn't that, um, tr uh, that gender identity, that transgender is the um, issue, it's the intolerant society that causes, I'm going to argue, those things. Particularly with transgender, um, I mean, we've seen, thankfully, a wonderful, uh, a, a significant shift, a lot to do yet, but a significant shift in terms of accepting gay identities, gay, lesbian, bi identities, so that if someone has uh, a gay son or a lesbian daughter, or a bi son or daughter, there's a greater level of acceptance, not quite there yet, but when it comes to having a transgender child, it is another kettle of fish. And so that there are issues often around loss, and many of the trans people I know have had to lose connection with significant others in their world. Something from a clinical perspective, because I'm talking today also you know, from a clinical perspective, is that if you speak to Tavistock, if you speak to GIC, if you look at them, there's some really interesting stuff coming out of Holland at the minute. The coincidence of autism and Asperger's and ADHD is just massively higher. Mm -hmm. So that um, the, the figures, I think they said, was 7.8 times a year, I should write it down to remind myself. Um, De Vries et al., the, well, the, the, the Dutch team, 7.8% of their client group were fed, met the criteria for Asperger's or autistic spectrum disorder against a national uh, baseline average of around 0.7 to 1%. So you're looking at kind of 10 times almost. Well, ADHD, which is my particular interest, um, at least five times the prevalence against a norm-referenced population. And so that presents particular challenges as a clinician to think about how do co other coexisting conditions interact with something as core as self-identity around gender. So, in the beginning, we are born, we're lying there, and somebody says, oh, you're a boy, you're a girl. You like these things because you're a boy, you like those things because you're a girl. And we go on. Well, how did they decide? And then we get to about three or four, and suddenly realise the only difference is a bit there. Because in other ways, the bodies are completely androgynous at that point. But that comes after three years, maybe, possibly four years, of going, well, why? Also, we think in terms of how children, in certain Western society, are socialised, they're in the playgroup. Is that your boyfriend? Is that your girlfriend? It's always heteronormative. So we need to think about this. So I come move very quickly then onto um, my research journey. And I have this lovely word, epistemology. I press the bell and the word manifests itself. Who remembers um, the uh, call my bluff? <laughs> epistemology then, the philosophy. <laughs> The philosophy is right. There's a, there's a group of people that go above about 40 who kind of get into that reference. <laughs> no, if it had a massive coma, you might get it here. But anyway, um, epistemology it's the, uh, the philosophy of knowledge. How do we know we know stuff, and how do we come to know stuff, and how do we know that we know the stuff that we know? Um, <laughs> now, I will fess up, okay? Born in the 60s, raised in the homophobic 70s, in a fairly homophobic, well, a fairly homophobic family, that's not. Okay, homophobic uh, subculture. So that, and then I, you know, I, I have this interesting life, and then in my 30s I train as a psychotherapist, and I do, um, you know, diplomas and stuff. 
And what do I learn about gay people? Well, there's, um, they must have had a dominant uh, mother and a weak or absent father. So I read it in a book. Yeah, no, I did, I did. And then there's this thing. So I'm, so I'm um, uh, this is about the year 2000 when I actually started doing the background reading because I knew kind of where I wanted to go. I knew that I had this thing in my head where I kind of felt this, this need, this desire to, to, to be female. But that was like obviously wrong because um, the only knowledge I would have is what I'd read in newspapers or seen on television. Growing up in the 1970s and 1980s, my, my information comes from the Sun newspaper. Yeah. My parents sometimes read the Daily Mail, God help me. Um, <laughs> or watching television. And so um, you'd learn about transvestites, these sick men who wear women's clothes and get a kick off that, and they're perverts. Um, or you learn about uh, these poor souls, these transsexuals, trucker Dave becomes Diana, spread across the <laughs> page. And neither um, narrative is particularly appealing because they're a freak show. Who remembers BBC doing um, George Julian? It was a um, programme about a trans woman um, going through Charing Cross. And it was scary. I thought it was scary. Because you had this psychiatrist really grilling into and really pathologizing this poor trans woman. And certainly in those days, the messages that were coming to me through the media and through my other, through the source of information I had access to, how do I know I know stuff? I read it in Sun or I saw it on the telly. Mm. That's how I know I know stuff. Was, oh, transsexuals always knew they were trapped in the wrong body and they want to have surgery and obviously, um, if you're a woman trapped in a man's body, then you want to have sex with men, because normal women have sex with men. And I'm thinking, actually, I don't fancy guys, I fancy women. Mm. And that only, oh, well, you're obviously a transvestite, then you're one of them uh, perverts. And it's like, oh, gosh. So my knowledge, my knowing, my possible identities are constrained by two very polarised, very binarised, very positivistic frameworks and conceptualizations which don't fit congruently and don't certainly offer me any hope, so I stay hiding. But my research anyway introduced me to transgender, so I learned about transgender um, in my 40s and it's a liberation. So funnily enough, in the last year I've met three trans men who didn't know they were trans men until they watched My Transsexual Summer on Channel 4. Wow. They'd not known that trans men existed because again if you look at the popular media, historically, it was always about trans women, transsexual, you know, the transsexual stories were always about man becomes woman narratives. So that was driven then by this kind of um, historical um, patriarchy um, within knowledge, and of course knowledge was constrained by editors, and editors are men, and so published work is controlled by editors, so books come through that kind of route. Um, and that certainly ten years ago we were looking at this idea of transsexualism and if you look at the interviews of, um, you know, the bits of television about uh, those interviews, it was, well, you won't make a convincing woman so we're not going to give you transsexual surgery anyway. Mm. Um, so unless you're going to pass convincingly, we're not going to treat you. That was how the zeitgeist was back a, a while ago. Mm. Thankfully now they take a slightly more, uh, well, they do take a more... Um, a much broader spectrum, and I know Penny Linehan and um, Christina and um, uh, we're talking about motor psychiatrist uh, Stuart, you know, and they're really lovely people, and they're, they're much more kind of they, they are enlightened. They're a new, new generation, if you like. Moving quickly on, then, um, if I mention the word Hakeem, I'm going to hear oh. people go. <laughs> 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 right. In fairness to, to Az Hakim, he has moved somewhat since 2007 and he, there has been a progression in terms of um, things. But anyway, I'm just going to look at this very, very quickly then. Um, this person is an ex-Marine, tried to do the, the, uh, the big tough man stuff, um, got, got married and had, and had kids and so on, and, and then attempts to become a young woman in her mid-30s by cross-dressing and then later by surgical hormone intervention. This is obviously... A defence against the ageing process and switch to another gender was in short and lease of life. Mm. <laughs> Simple, right, but... 
I have to confess, as uh, a trans woman who's come out in her 40s, I am gutted, because I reckon the best time to be a woman is in your early 30s. And I have totally missed out on like the best time, and I can't help feeling rather mournful and kind of wistful. So, oh, I, can't, I don't want to be a middle-aged woman. I'm, I'm, you know. So the idea of wanting to, at some level, try and claim just a bit of, oh, can I be a 30-year-old and just for a bit? Mm -hmm. you know, I, I might have missed out on all the fun of, of, of being a teen girl, mm -hmm. I can't get away with that, but can I maybe try? So there's something of how do we read this, through a positivistic, mm -hmm. um, heteronormative lens, or through an alternative lens, which um, I, I personally find a liberation in, in the idea of queer theory and the queer lens, and I know some people um, less so. This comes from Richard Eakins, 1997, and I find a, a real kind of disquiet and a, and a tragedy. For me, there's a tragedy in this story where we've got a person who splits. <coughs> ben likes fixing the car, Deirdre likes doing the housework, and I'm kind of thinking, well, isn't it a shame that somebody feels the need to split into two binaries? Can Deirdre not actually fix the car? Can Ben not do a bit of housework? Mm -hmm. And we think about how do we know <coughs> stuff? How, do we, how does our knowledge come about? And if maybe, actually, because Ben's, Ben's, I think it was saying here, he's in the church, I know there's somewhere in the, in the story anyway, he is, um, you know, he's strong in the church and so on, and that maybe there's something about the conditioning where he's learned his stuff has maybe mm -hmm. made um, crossing genders unacceptable in the public domain, mm -hmm. so he splits. And I find that kind of um, sad because it's constraining. One of the challenges, then, for clinicians is this positivism, this positivistic science filters down and that then patients arrive and think that they've got to follow a very fixed script to gain access to treatment and that means then that when we're studying this patient group or this client group the risk is that the stories are taken at a surface level and become self-reiterative rather than broadening the bandwidth now, in, in, when, you know, when you speak to people like Penny and, and Stuart and, other, and, and Christina down at the Charing Cross Centre, they actually expect to see much more uncertainty, they expect to see much more diversity in the narrative. And, uh, you know, I've actually had it myself. I've had clients pitch up, uh, I know I'm a woman, um, I want surgery, I want this, uh, my, my life will start immediately after I have surgery and hormones, I want it now. Um, obviously, I played with dolls when I was a child, and obviously, um, you know, this will all make my life better. And, because I'm not part of that gatekeeping process, I can say, you know, chill puppy, you know, let's actually create an open space where you, you can actually explore your doubt and uncertainty. Because Lord knows I've contemplated surgery, it scares the hell out of me. I went to a, co well, I went a couple of a year and a half ago, I went to the conference at uh, Charing Cross, and just walking, walking up the steps to the hospital building, I had this shiver going through my, my, my whole body. And I thought, God, would I, you know, the times when I thought, do I want to go for surgery? What would it feel like to be walking up these steps going, I'm going to go see someone and have a surgery? And mm. it, it sent a shiver through my spine. It terrifies me. But is that the only way to live authentically, legitimately? Do I have to surrender my body to science to have it modified to make it socially acceptable? So, we come then to this idea of, um, could we broaden the bandwidth? What are the possibilities? Anne Fausto Sterling is an interesting writer. She was particularly talking about um, uh, intersex conditions. But here, here's what she says, because inter the intersex movement for a long time was, again, crowbarred into this binary of male or female. And um, there's, a, there's a, uh, an argument to say, come on, let's let people grow and develop naturally and make their own choices rather than inflicting it on babies who don't have any choice. So Sterling writes, imagine a world in which the same knowledge that has, been in, that has enabled medicine to intervene in the management of intersex <coughs> patients had been placed at the service of multiple sexualities. Imagine that the sexes have multiplied, multiplied beyond currently imaginable limits. Imagine it would have to be a world of shared powers, patient and physician, parent and child, male and female, heterosexual and homosexual. All those oppositions and others would have to be dissolved as sources of division. A new ethic of medical treatment would arise, one that would permit ambiguity in a culture that had overcome sexual division. I think that's a really mm. insightful um, philosophy, a theory, an idea. Now, um, in your table discussions, I want you just to have a look at this, think about it, 
and uh, it might be quite an interesting an idea for the table discussions. I'm proposing a model for what I've termed fourth order feminism, but you can call it what you like. Um, here's where it goes, and I'll whiz through it. Imagine then that the things that we know as gendered traits and attitudes were not male or female, but if we ascribe certain traits and behaviours as masculine and or feminine, that we might say, I have quite a few of those, but I have quite a few of those. And I might sit in a space that if I'm Rambo, well, yeah, you know, all, all male and no female girly stuff, and if I'm Barbie, it's like, oh, I like this. But maybe actually <laughs> some of us could sit in a space here. And then, who am I attracted to? Am I attracted to particularly male types, particularly female types, or something in the middle? Might I find sexual attraction sits in a space here? Mm. And that would be both physical and psychological. Because it's, you know, it's, the, it's the body and the mind, the thing that we're drawn to. And then we might think about our own personal physical embodiment. The, um, the degree to which our body is read and or conforms to the, to the current society's ideas of masculine and feminine. So that, that how I see myself in terms of my traits, who I'm drawn to at a sexual level, and how my body is represented uh, or, or recognised... And that the fourth axis is time, because as over, over time our bodies change, maybe our identities and, and sense of self changes and modifies. So that, that allows a fluidity throughout the whole lifespan. So that's my um, rather kind of out-the-box um, notion which you can play with around the tables um, later. But it's all very well, all this highfalutin stuff. <coughs> These bloody liberal do-gooders with their fanciful ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy if you live on a rough estate and people are chucking bricks through your bloody windows you ain't worried about ooh I wonder if I might be gender queer or gender ambiguous uh, no you're just going I'm shit scared and I don't want to be read as anything other than normal so we're going to look as that's that kind of idea of at a very basic level people are primarily focused on safety um, and for those of us who are fortunate enough to have created environments where we might live more safely and we're able to form relationships and build our sense of self, maybe we do become this kind of hierarchical group of, of, of aspiring or self-actualizing individuals who think these, these creative ideas that don't necessarily relate for people down on the ground. So I'm kind of acknowledging that it's not the same for all people. Mm. Chas Bono says, you know, that for a lot of people, we're seen, you know, trans people seen as crazy people, some kind of mental defect. And so the arguments about do we categorise it in DSM-5 or not, if we categorise it, it's medicalised, so therefore it's an illness when it shouldn't be. But then if we don't categorise it, you can't have treatment. So, so it, you know, that's, mm. that is dumbing down. <laughs> Months of debate that people would have about do we have it or not. <laughs> <laughs> the fab Zoe Davies in the room, how cool is that? <laughs> um, I, uh, I didn't know you were going to be here, and I said that's, that's kind of really funny, but anyway. Um, I really enjoy this book, um, and then it relates into this thing. So basically then, I've um, said in this slide that scientists were trying to cure homosexuality. Back in the early 20th century, very honest, very well-meaning, very ethically driven scientists and medical professionals tried to cure homosexuality with good intent. We now, of course, view that very differently. But their motivation was very genuine at the time. I think it's important to think about the social and historical context. We've now realised society needed to not be intolerant towards people with the same sex attraction. I'm asking this, and it's a radical thought, but it's the kind of idea that at the moment we invest a lot in the idea of um, perfecting medical technologies that cure transsexualism. And I certainly do not begrudge anyone who uh, might benefit from surgical and or hormonal intervention. I'm thinking about the people who are not able to access surgery or for whom it may not be appropriate. And I'm, I'm saying, is it possible, if we go back to that quote from Anne Fausto Sterling about multiple sexualities, 
if we as a society create the space for multiple identities and multiple sexualities so that people have a greater width to choose from, I'm going to argue that maybe that's a kind of better thing and that maybe in the future we could look back and, and, and see kind of it was quite gruesome some of the protocols that, that we might have now. Um, so, so Davy's book, um, I, I would definitely recommend as a read, and you'll see my, my review on Amazon, um, because it considers the personal, political, and medical fact that they, all these different factors that, that, that create diagnoses and label identity categories and contexts. So, um, very readable, but definitely worth a, a, a purchase. So, one of the things that I'm going to say then is that the limitations of the medical solution is that it's sought to fix the problem by creating proper males and proper females and that that has um, difficulties. So that, as Stephen Whittle writes, whilst the trans man will experience some problems in the first year or so of transition, these often fade away as they quickly come to look physically very masculine, at least while clothed. On the other hand, this is Stephen Whittle writing, on the other hand, many trans women will face difficulties for many years of their lives as they struggle with the limitations of medicine and surgery to facilitate their passing as ordinary women in their day-to-day -day life. Consequently, they are more likely to become victims of transphobia and are more likely to experience the social stigmatization that comes with it. So that's Stephen Whittle writing in 2007. Um, Dr. Kerry Costello writes, I hate the term passing, and he goes on to say, this is why every time I listen to one of the many people I've met who are afraid to transition and cry, I can't, I'll never be able to pass as a man or a woman, I sigh, because I know that the real battle they face is not their bodily structure, but their internalised sexism, which tells them they don't have the right to claim their true gender identities, because their bodies trump their inner truth. Sexism holds that appearance is all, and that trans people who don't conform to binary sex ideals are fakes and freaks, and they deserve to be mocked and harassed. So, concerned then about the physical risks to my body for surgery and hormones, I faced a dilemma. Was it possible to be transgender? Was it possible to not try and pass as a woman, because I know I won't, but to try and present an identity that is in some way congruent that communicates the females. But I'm sitting in, in my house thinking, if I step outside that front door wearing a skirt and makeup, what's going to happen? Shall we find out? <laughs> now, Cardiff City Centre, a Tuesday lunchtime. Let's see what happens when a trans person goes out on the street. Let me just click on that link. Is that still up here? Okay. I want you to carefully observe the reactions of the people.
very expensive film to make, I had to employ two and a half thousand extras to just act totally normal like there's nothing happening. <laughs> you would have believed it. You know, that you could just walk down the street. It's okay, it works. Okay. So what I've endeavoured to do then is, in my own way, to explore the idea of communicating femaleness on a male frame and to do it with a degree of authenticity. And people say, well, why do you, you know, because I've, I've been criticised by um, uh, trans, transvestites and, and hardcore transsexuals as you're simply not trying hard enough. And it's like, well, if people are confused, they, hopefully they don't read me as this idea of the transvestite that they're seeing there's a, there's a mixture of genders. Mm. So that actually the beard kind of works as a sort of happy mistake, really. So that's that one there. Um, very quickly then, in terms of when a client comes to therapy, um, and I'm going to give you a handout to, to reflect on in a minute, but basically the client comes, the client experiences shame, there is a filter in front, and the client sees their shame. They, they read their shame this way. We can see they see shame, but we don't read shame, just they have it but they have their motivations and expectations, and they have these influences. The therapist is also a real person. The therapist has all of this stuff enacting on them, and when the therapist meets the client in the room, they're not alone. The room is full of influences. And that this here is the diagram I'm going to give you to take away to discuss at your table discussions about all of the elements and forces and influences that are part of the dynamic of two people sat on their own in a room together. So that, that bit there, um, that bit there, there's, um, I'm going to show you that one there. That's another book that is so worth a read. Um, three and a half thousand uh, trans, modern trans people being interviewed. Um, say so they came up, and they asked people, how do you identify your gender identity? They got uh, 400 and something like 423 variations. <laughs> but what they're saying is, and they work in academia, they're saying that a new generation is coming through that is breaking those binaries. They're not conventional transsexuals, and, and that they're coming up with new identities. That's me. That's my new edition of my book, because the original book was, was written for the academic market. That's a more readable market, and it's got an extra chapter that the other one didn't have. And that's me. Thank you very much. And that's the handouts, and I'll hand these ones out.